Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Rudolf van der Berg. Rudolf is a consultant with 20 years of experience in internet, telecom, privacy, online content, standardization, and related topics. In the past, Rudolf was an economist and policy analyst at the OECD, working on telecommunications and internet-related policy. He notably wrote reports on machine-to-machine -machine communication, Internet of Things, Connected Television, Mobile Termination Rates, Fixed Mobile Convergence, International Cables, and Internet Exchange Points. Working together with Beric, he organized two meetings on IP interconnection, which brought the internet peering community and regulators together. So basically, an expert in internet plumbing. So Rudolf, you know about our 3 plus 1 format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment at the end. So let's start with question one, which is, how do you interpret the relationship between users accessing more content and services online and the impact this may have on telecom operators? Yeah, I don't actually see a lot of a relationship. Telecom firms provide a pipe and if that pipe can handle it, then consumers can access certain content. So the pipe is wide enough and then you can do stuff like online gaming. Um, you saw that with Google Stadia, which was more popular in Europe than in the US because our pipes are better. Hmm. And it's not so much that you introduce content and this has effect on the telcos. No, it's the other way around. You have a good connection to your home and you start using it. I got 10 megabits in 1994 on the campus of 20 University, and we started doing stuff on the internet that nobody was thinking about. Microsoft came to look like, what kind of madness is this? Why are you complaining that Windows 95 is bugging? Well, we have 10 megabit to each student's room and we do all this kind of stuff. And they were like, uh, oh yeah, we never expected that. And then they paid a professor in four PhDs to learn from that and to use that into Windows 95. So it's the other way around. When you have a good connection, you can do stuff. If the connection is broken, you can't do anything. So that's where it is. And um, that also means that when telecom firms build better networks, people want them. And we see in competitive markets that people flock to the fastest network. So in the Netherlands, we have cable in 98% of the households and DSL and an increasing amount of FTT, but where there's only DSL and cable, two thirds of the people go to cable because DSL is rubbish for most things that people want to use, particularly if you're further away from the exchange. And DSL is significantly declining in the market because particularly with COVID, people noticed I can't work from home if I have this DSL connection, particularly not with a family. So they move to cable, but when there's FTTH, people move from cable and DSL straight away to FTTH because it serves them so much better. You can actually have four people doing online classes at home and doing all kinds of stuff and it works. And it has nothing to do with watching Netflix or all those other kinds of things. It is just being able to send a file to your colleague and not having to wait half an hour for it to arrive or to hear your wife scream that because you send it, she can't do her uh, meeting online. Um, that's where it's at. You first need a connection that can actually handle it and then you start doing stuff. And that, of course, is the way it works in the real world too with roads, etc. If you don't have proper roads, you can build a really nice harbor, but nobody will bring stuff there because they can't get it out of the harbor. And if you do have roads, then it becomes interesting to start businesses, etc., in a certain location because you can transport stuff out. It's the same in the digital world. You first need a good connection. And if Delco 
builds a good connection, if it's an incumbent or a new entrant, people will go there. And it has always been the case that particularly incumbents were very reluctant to invest. So when I started in this business, we started the Dutch-German Internet Exchange in the east of the Netherlands because at Twente University, well, we had 10 megabit, then we had 100 megabit. We had a student who started Booking.com. Um, he left campus, wanted to use the internet there, but it costed 10,000 euro per two megabit. In Amsterdam, it costed 2,000 euro at that time. You can save a lot of money, get a, 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 an office, a secretary, etc., and the internet in Amsterdam. The university was first. So we started an internet exchange in 2001. And the first presentation I gave about that internet exchange was right frog. And then there was a gentleman from Deutsche Telekom. I didn't know he was from Deutsche Telekom. He said, I live in Münster. It is stupid to start an internet exchange in Münster and connect it with uh, the Netherlands. There's absolutely no reason for that. There's nothing in Münster to connect it to. And I told him, well, I don't know who you are, but if you have Viper in Germany, maybe we can work together and bring it to a better place. There were 400 people in that room. Then they all laughed, and I had no idea why they laughed. But they had all tried to work together with Deutsche Telekom to get better and faster internet in Germany, or peer with Deutsche Telekom in Germany, and they refused. And this was the guy who always refused, so I got off stage and the head of the London Internet Exchange then the largest internet exchange said, well, that is how you reply to Deutsche Telekom. And, well, you know, and that's 20 years ago, 2001 Prague Right meeting. And it's like we hear, still hear the same story. I'm just happy that, you know, from that simple internet exchange in the Netherlands, also came things like Deutsche Glasfaser, the same people who sat on it or there, uh, or sat on the table there and discussed with us, started building Deutsche Glasfaser. So, you know, Deutsche Telekom helped start its own competition in the FTTH market, in part by stimulating us to do what we did. And um, that's fantastic. But people need good connections. They need fiber. And if incumbents are unwilling to build it, somebody else will. But it's never about the content. Thank you, Rudolf. So, so think you are replacing maybe the theory of some that there is a vicious circle between content and connectivity to a more virtuous circle where good connectivity drives demand for content and the willingness of people to, pa to pay for that good connectivity and to upgrade to do more. Um, uh, I, I like the wife shouting at you, by the way. I do that sometimes, I have to admit usually to my kids, uh, when they're using too much uh, bandwidth. Um, but the discussion is there and it's on the table, let's say, about, you know, changing maybe the economics of the internet or tweaking them. Um, and that leads me to the second question, which is, what are the inherent dangers, if any, of big tech being requested uh, to pay or to pay more, maybe more accurately, for the network of telecom operators? Well, generally, the biggest issue is that whoever looks like a big user today and is not the same tomorrow. So I'm writing a paper for a client on this whole idea um, for tech, big tech pay, and I found an OECD paper from 1996, 1997 where European operators were complaining that up to 20% of traffic was DNS traffic to .com DNS servers in the United States. And all of that had to go across the ocean and was costing them a lot. And that between countries in Europe, there were no direct interconnections. So a lot of that traffic flowed through the United States as well. Now, what if we then would have said, well, let's have the DNS companies pay for it because it's 20% of traffic. How dare they? And now it is like, well, it's Netflix, except of course in Italy at this moment, it's football that's driving the peak. In the UK, it's football that's driving the peak. In the Netherlands, it's Formula One. 
that's driving the peak. Formula One was two and a half terabits of KPN's network. And it handled it easily. So, yes, Netflix is part of it. But also, thinking of it the other way, let's say we would forbid people to watch all these online shows, you know, it's just a waste of waste of their brains anyways, let them read books. We would still want to be able to do online classes and online meetings and all that kind of stuff. So I still want a gigabit to my home. Even if we don't allow people to do all that wasteful gaming and video and, and watching series, etc., we still want video conferences that work. We still want online classes that work. It will help our economy. It still means I need a gigabit to my home. Nothing changes everywhere, anywhere in the network if we get rid of content. Plus, of course, that there's a lot of European content too. And if we just start charging the Americans, we probably will start charging the Europeans too. And it, other element is um, almost everybody already pays and pays a lot, and particularly in countries like Germany and France. And Orange has only one transit party, open transit. Everybody has to pay to them to deliver traffic to their network. Probably the only ones that still don't pay are the big ones. So everybody who is smaller already pays. In Germany, everybody pays Deutsche Telekom. Otherwise, your traffic just doesn't arrive there. You have backup loss. And we noticed that in the Netherlands, when Deutsche Telekom all of a sudden one weekend decided to reroute all traffic from T-Mobile Netherlands away from the Amsterdam Internet Exchange and peerings in the Netherlands, all to Frankfurt and other places in Germany. It was only 200 gigabyte, uh, gigabits of traffic. It wasn't a lot. It should have been easily handled, you know. The most the Dutch should have noticed was that their ping in a PlayStation game would have gone up by like three milliseconds or something. In a well-managed network, it shouldn't have mattered at all. The effect was that Dutch Telecom didn't have any interconnections with the big Dutch networks. There was packet loss to the Dutch Academic Network surfnet of 30%. And the reaction of Deutsche Telekom was basically like, yes, well, then they should just buy transit from us. But surfnet and every other network, you know, already had massive transit. They already paid for their internet. It was just that Deutsche Telekom didn't buy enough. We had parliamentary questions about it. And then after a week, Deutsche uh, T-Mobile Netherlands changed it back. Also because it completely broke their campaign for their new one gigabit offer, combined with unlimited mobile, for 50 euro. And everybody was like, yo, great that you have it, but if you can't do anything with it, why would I buy it from you? You know, it costed them two years to fix that damage in their reputation. When COVID started, Deutsche Telekom, of course, had a lot of students who came home to their parents that were on the network and wanted to access the university. Deutsche Forschungsnet uh, had an ESU that students couldn't access their university classes from Deutsche Telekom's network because Deutsche Telekom didn't have enough transit and didn't have enough interconnection. Deutsche Forschungsnet has an interconnection with everybody and transit from a multitude of places, including from JL, the European Academic Network System. What happened? Deutsche Telekom wouldn't, didn't want to upgrade its interconnections with anybody unless the German universities paid for it. So now the German universities have an extra pipe specifically to Deutsche Telekom. Not because they wanted to, not because they needed, not because they didn't have any capacity, but because Deutsche Telekom refused to invest, well, 5,000 to 20,000 euro, but probably because it's Deutsche Telekom, they make it very difficult with procedures. Let's say the Deutsche Telekom would have to invest 150,000 euro because they are Deutsche Telekom mostly. 
we have gotten this work. But they refused, and they made the universities pay for it. So there are inherent dangers to this proposal, but they're on the side of telecom firms. They're lazy. They don't want to invest in interconnection. And if they get extra money for it, for being lazy, they will continue this practice. So we shouldn't, absolutely shouldn't do this. You should actually learn from what happens in the Ukraine. In the Ukraine, they used to have, before 2012, 2013, a very centralized internet. Then the Russians started DDoSing it, and they realized that they couldn't use their interconnection, their, their internet anymore. Now they have 19 internet exchanges in 19 towns. The Russians can bomb a link all they want, but traffic finds a new route through BGP everywhere. And because everything is local, it's harder to break it, but it's also cheaper to interconnect. And it forces content providers to bring traffic local. We've seen that in the Netherlands, where KPM uses the open connect caches of Netflix in almost every major town. It saves KPM a lot of interconnections between a lot of towns, a lot of interfaces, a lot of lines, by putting a box in each town. In France, everything comes from Paris. When recently, somebody literally cut through fiber links in France, he took down the French internet with a couple of cuts. Why is that? Because everything is centralized. Why is there not a Netflix interconnection in Bordeaux with Orange? Why is there not a Netflix interconnection in Lyon with Orange? That is what we should learn from the Ukraine. If you have interconnections everywhere, it's hard to break it. And that's how the internet was built. That's how BGP works. So the inherent danger is that if we pay telcos, they won't fix their networks. And they'll just say it's the other guy's fault. That's what they have been doing for the last 20 years. 25 even. And... There's no reason to reward bad behavior. It's actually a nice, nice closing line to that question is basically the, the biggest inherent danger you see, aside from the fact that big tech would probably not be the only victims uh, in, in such a scenario is that um, you, you see a, a danger of continuing to promote inefficiencies to a certain extent. And and not um, you know and not encouraging them to do better, smarter, and more decentralized. Um, I, I I think that brings us to a, a more um, say a more specific question, but it's one that was raised in some of the papers circulated by telecom operators. Is um, do you think it is appropriate to compare the contribution of big tech or content providers more generally? and telecom operators in infrastructure as suggested by some, the some being obviously um, telcos? Um, no, in, in general, no, because the network costs the same whether I would use big tech or not. So a fiber connection in the Netherlands to a home is on average 700 to 800 euros. The active equipment with a lifespan between five and eight years is 240 euro, roughly in the business case. Nothing changes if I use a lot of content or no content because all those investments are exactly the same. And in the Netherlands, we have a gold rush at the moment with the rollout of, of mobile of fixed networks. We have three operators all investing there's three and a half to four million homes to go and there's enough money for five and a half million homes so it gives you an idea of how much telcos want to invest um if you then look at what kind of use will we make of it well at this moment people are looking at netflix and youtube and, and stuff but there's of course also online gaming that's a massive market where, for example, the French company i3D, Ubisoft, 
is massive in. Well, they, you know, gaming these days as a market is larger than movies. Should we ask them for money too? And should we ask the Dutch tax service because it saved hundreds of millions in paper because everybody does their findings online? Should we ask municipalities who certainly since COVID have finally learned to do Microsoft Teams and work? I'm part-time working for the Dutch Association of Municipalities. And I started before COVID and the biggest issue was like, we need to schedule a meeting and we need to get everybody in the physical same place. And um, the association now has an issue where they want to have physical meetings again between mayors and almost all the mayors are like, yeah, but I like the online a lot more because then I can do it from my town hall and I don't need to travel all the way across the country. And the Netherlands is small, I know, you know, it's only two hours to The Hague and back, but still, that's like a whole day in the life of a mayor and he could do that meeting in an hour. And we now actually have rules that, okay, four online meetings a year and two physical meetings, but then we do expect you to come. Now, just calculate how much that saves in the time of firms, in the way we work, how much we save through booking.com by being able to compare hotels, how much we save by doing this, that, and the other online. And all those savings are never included anywhere other than, you know, at the OECD, we had it. economists do it bit of a back of an envelope, but nice calculation that for each extra autonomous system per 100,000 or per million inhabitants, there was an increase in GDP growth of about 0.01% continuously in the years after. That doesn't sound like a lot, 0.1% GDP growth extra. But for a country like the Netherlands, after seven or eight years, because it's continuous, that's seven or eight billion extra in GDP on top of what it would have normally achieved. You know, that basically pays for the network by having more internet use, by having more autonomous systems or more firms using it, etc. So, what I mean here, this is just jealousy. This is just, well, they sound cooler than us. You know, we're EU telco, and no girl wants to date us, no movie star, because we work there, and they do want to date the people from Netflix or Google or whatever. Yes, well, you know, then you should have been creative and make movies and, you know, generally be broken core like most actors and directors because most people don't become big in that world. Mm -hmm. Or you can be a boarding telco executive and make good money every month again. You know, my family pays, I think now, 150 euro a month to our telco. I don't pay that much to Disney, Netflix, and a whole lot of them. And yes, my kids like their PlayStation, but they will scream bloody murder if I take away their internet data and their mobile phone. Because the first thing they want is to be connected to their friends. That's the most important thing. All the YouTubes, etc., is extra. But first, they need to be able to use WhatsApp and all this, you know, communication. That's what we need. The rest is bonus. Thank you, Rudolf. I, I, I take away two main things. One, the fixed costs are there regardless of what goes through the pipe. Uh, and the variable ones are not extremely significant, significant let's say, in terms of, of the ratio. Um, 
and also the fact, and, and that is something that several guests on this podcast have, have highlighted, is that pipes and, and infrastructure is very much more about connectivity to each other than content, first and foremost. And as you said, content is a bonus to a certain extent. But during COVID, I think we all experienced that the fact that it was a lifeline to others, um, you know, our, our, our pipe coming in our house. And, and that's what we valued most is being able to, you know, video chat with the grandmother, um, you know, continue school, uh, continue talking to friends and all of that. So, yeah, I think that the connectivity part is one that is not sufficiently highlighted. And it's one that also shows that there is power for infrastructure providers because they are the ones providing that lifeline to us that, that we need. Yeah, it's it's very simple. The only reason why incumbent telecom firms currently invest in FTTH is because there are competitors entering their markets in almost every country. And if they don't build, somebody else will and steals away all the customers. So Telefonica, Orange, Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone, they don't invest in new networks because of Netflix. Absolutely not. They couldn't care less. They invest because Deutsche Glaswasser invests, because KKR and similar investment funds put billions in there. KPN invests because the pension fund of Deutsche Telekom is one of the investors in Open Dutch Fiber, which is rolling out um, over a million connections in competition with KPN. EQT, which is an investment front of the Swedish Wallenberg family, owns Delta in the Netherlands and is also rolling out a million FTTH homes. In part also because they realized that, for example, Dutch rural connections to farmers, which costed more, actually paid the extra investment of two and a half, three and a half thousand euros on average up front and deducted it from taxes as an investment. So they realized that actually, if you roll out fiber to the farm in the Netherlands, which is quite dense, I know it's not as rural as some places, the farmers would basically fund it up front themselves, but you could read where, you know, the money from is for decades to come. And we had a gold rush and 90% of farms are now reached and the last 10% will be reached in the next two or three years. And then there's like 20 or 30,000 places left that are really too expensive. But, you know, everybody was at first like, oh, fiber to the farm, that's impossible. Nobody will do that. That's too expensive. And then the first project started and they thought that they would have to fund everything with loans. And then the farmers started paying it up front. You know, here's 3,000 euro per farm. Start digging, please. <laughs> the, I, so, yeah. Wasn't it, aware of the concept of fiber to the farm. <laughs> to be, I'm discovered, I knew fiber to the home, but now we have fiber to the farm. <laughs> yes, well, they are too far away from the, for DSL. Yeah. So they would often have not even one megabit of connectivity. Yeah. Well, if then somebody shows up and says, I can give you a gigabit of fiber and you can deduct that investment for taxes too for your business and a farm is a business well three thousand euro on the business of a farm is not that much and if that also helps you run your robot milk machine in the netherlands we have lots of milk so um if it also helps the robot cleaning the uh stable Hey, that's a little investment compared to how much a milk machine costs. But you can't download the updates for the milk machine because you only have 200 kilobits of connectivity to your farm. That's the stupid situation that they were literally in. So, of course, you pay 3,000 or 5,000 up front and let the tax man pay half because you can deduct it. But that's the way... It works. You want to be connected. And nobody forces telcos to invest in fiber to the home, except their own shareholders who see 
that otherwise KKR, EQT, pension funds, and all the others will do it. Because everybody wants better connectivity. Yep. I, I think that's maybe the trick in living in Belgium. Um, I certainly feel it is that the more competition there is, the more you are pushed to being better probably as a telco, uh, certainly as an incumbent telco. But um, we, we're reaching the, the end of the podcast, the, the soapbox moments. Um, so I've put on screen uh, the two strong women in Brussels, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, president of the European Commission, Roberta Metzola, president of the European Parliament. We know there will be discussions and maybe even legislative proposals looking at introducing new internet access fees, a fair contribution, something, um, uh, and possibly a consultation in the fall on those ideas. But now is your time to tell those uh, ladies and basically the powers that be in Brussels what you think they should do or what they should focus on to um, you know, bring benefits to the users, to the businesses uh, in Europe? Well, my first point to them is that the telcos have basically been complaining about the cost of internet for over 25 years and sometimes longer. It's the same people making the same remarks as in 2011 when I started the better OECD meeting to IP interconnection. And we had the telcos there, they were able to present their case. Heck, they had 19 million of financing from the European Commission in better quality of service for interconnection um, in the ETEX project. They had everything, except they had no valid reason for it. They had no cause for it. They were basically misrepresenting everything to the Commission then and wasted the taxpayers' money on it, a lot of it. And they still do. They're fighting the same battles, pointing at the same outsiders as the reason for their own mistakes. They need to invest in fiber, yes. And their shareholders will reap benefits for, for, from that for over 50 years to come. That's their business. What goes up for that? is largely irrelevant. The traffic growth, on average, a Dutch household uses four megabit per second, including IPTV. That's what KPN says. We're building one gigabit, 10 gigabit, that's 10,000 megabits to each home. Um, even with growth rates of 30, 40% per year, it will take a while before we reach that. Most of that traffic can be handled within 30 kilometers from their home. So there fundamentally is no reason to break the internet, to break the innovation, break the content delivery over the internet by handing out money to incompetent telecom operators. And particularly not when those same telecom operators are saying, oh, Nokia built this 240 terabit switch. We think it's really uh, fantastic, and we only have 30 terabits in our network, so one switch can handle easily Orange, France, all of its traffic. Why are you promoting on the one hand that, and on the other hand saying you need money for it? Why is Orange selling one gigabit for 35 euros, if it has an average traffic of three or four megabits? And basically, the question is being lied to for the end team time for the last 20 years because the internet is promote, uh, is put down as something foreign, something for outsiders, the outsiders make money out. We have the best broadband in Europe, in the world, basically, because of all the regulations the EU has. It is cheap, it is fast, and we make lots more use of it than many other places, and we often don't see the benefits anymore. Yes, it would be great if we had a European Netflix. It would be awesome if we had a European YouTube. But we at least we have a European Booking.com and Just Eat from 20 University. That's at least something that we can celebrate. Um, there's a lot more money to be made on and over the internet. 
than just TV series. And there are other ways to promote and stimulate that. Tom, be the network works because some telco executive wants a picture of him with an actress. They're just, that's just not logical. Because we had the good networks in Europe, COVID wasn't such an issue as in the United States. We didn't have students going to McDonald's to be able to follow their class. The biggest issue Dutch cities had was that some families didn't have four laptops, but they did have four children. Well, we fixed that by giving them a laptop. And our issue in Europe is not the networks. Our issue is making use of them and not being jealous of somebody outside. Instead, of, we should promote that at least we have the networks. We can make use of them and we will benefit for them for the next 50 years. Thank you, uh, Rudolf. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually discovered uh, in the States that there is, it's a label to say uh, McDonald internet. It seems that's when you have choppy bad internet <laughs> and under, under suboptimal conditions, it's called McDonald's internet. Um, but yes, I think we, we are lucky in Europe and, and the the provision of connectivity in Europe is 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 good, and and as you said, I think there is pride for telecom operators and their challengers. I think uh, of of what has been achieved in Europe, and let's hope that the focus is on those elements, on the increasing of efficiencies, on the um, you know promoting initiatives by others than the incumbents, maybe yeah. um, because. Everyone needs someone breathing down their neck to get better. That's that's basically what you're telling us. Yeah, and, and it, look, Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom and Orange all have something to be proud of these days. Orange has rolled out FTTH to more people than we could have ever expected in Spain. And now in Spain, you can get very good fiber in almost every town and location. And Telefonica has made that, that possible. Orange challenged by some operators in France, delivers great FTTH these days and has interesting services on their boxes and stuff, you know, like good hardware. Deutsche Telekom still provides a lot of Germany with good and reliable internet with, you know, these days also very good modems and stuff and, and could achieve a lot more if it, if it wanted to. That's where you should focus. Not that somehow somebody somewhere is making money over your internet. It's like being annoyed at a lawyer that he makes four hundred euro, uh, you know, four hundred euros an hour, when you charge him like five euros an hour for a phone call in the past. It's it's a different world, you know that. They just let them do their stuff, let you do your stuff. And if you then look at the revenues each of them makes and how stable they are, there's not a European that will give up their broadband connection. They will first cut down their food shoppings and everything else, basically, before they will give up their broadband connection. How, if you're that high in a mass of pyramid of or, or that low end of minimum if that's that basic provided and with pride and you know let all the other people worry about their things but people will f first cut netflix before they cut deutsche telekom that, that i think is is the best um closing sentence is to a positive one of pride and uh, one of uh, reassurance to them saying um, you may have to invest a lot, but your return of investment is quite guaranteed seeing our dependence on you. Um, thank you so much, Rudolf, for, for your time uh, and for all the, the very um, detailed uh, and specific um, examples, which were extremely useful from a pan-European point of view. And um, I'm telling that to all my guests. 
this conversation is not ended. We will continue it probably in the fall. And uh, I hope that arguments and, and specific evidence is the way the conversation goes rather than just emotions and uh, gut feelings or the states of certain uh, companies. Thank yes. you so much, Rudolf. <laughs> <laughs>